We, I can't believe we're already three weeks into this series called Unshakable. I love that song, Unshakable. As your pastor, one of the things that is so passionate to me is to try to help you the best way that I can, help you reach your full potential in Christ, that you become all that you have the capability of becoming. And really, that's what this series has been all about, is about learning how to be unshakable in your faith, trusting God no matter what you go through in life, that you make it through victoriously. So today we're going to talk about how to make it through hardship. You know, one of the things that I hear being a pastor, because people will come to church oftentimes as a result of some of the hardship that they go through in life. How many of you know when you go through a difficult time, it'll make you ask questions. Sometimes it'll make you ask the right questions and you'll show up in church and seek out the answers, which is a good thing. That's one of the benefits of the, of the issues of life is many times they drive us into God's presence and we begin to ask those questions. Well, I want to help some things today. I actually want to start off with prayer because one thing I do know about this message, really this series, but today what I'm going to share with you, the enemy of your soul does not want you to get what I'm going to share with you today. He would love to distract you, to get you thinking about some of the things that you have to do on your to-do list tomorrow or later this afternoon. And my prayer for you today is that you are fully present in this service because uh, I'm going to bring it today. And, and I want you, I hope you understand I'm not saying that pridefully. I've been studying this all week. I know what I'm getting ready to bring to you. And you have the potential, that the, the content that's going to come coupled with the Holy Spirit, which is what we're going to pray for, will give some rhema revelation understanding to you today that will allow you to overcome some of the circumstances that you face in life, okay? So let me pray for you. Father, as we're gathered together today, we show up at church. Sometimes we come just because we know we're supposed to. And uh, sometimes we come because we are seeking truth and answers. And then, Father, sometimes we're here just because of the obedience of loving you coming together. But today, for these next few minutes that we are together, I ask you to open our hearts. We choose to receive the word that you have for us. And we fully engage with the cooperation of your Holy Spirit today today to speak a revelation word today that will help us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. If you have your outline, you can follow along with me. Uh, Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2 talks about why we should study the way that Jesus ran the race. Now think about this. Jesus is the Son of God. And he literally, the Bible says in John 1, 1, this is kind of the science part of God. How many of you know he's the great scientist? John 1, 1 says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and the Word was with God, and the Word became flesh. His name is Jesus. He was the Messiah, the Christ, and because of that, he had the anointing. That's what the Messiah was, or the Christ. The Christ means the anointed one. And when he showed up, here it is, God himself who humbles himself and becomes one of us to live this life that we live, to face the issues of life. The scripture says that he faced all the trials, all the temptation that we all face. He went through all of those things in his 33 and a half years that he was here and that he overcame them. And then here in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2, it says, study how he did it. Because he was the beginner, he began and he ended his race. It says, watch how he did it, model his self because he went through a lot of shame in the process because he kept his eye on the vision and on the goal, which by the way, the goal was to have a relationship with you and I, an intimate relationship with God. And so it says, study how he did it. So we're going to do that. So then the next verse in your outline is John 16, verse 33. And I love the message translation, because it goes along with the name of our series, it says, I've told you all of these things so that you'll trust me and you will be unshakable and assured, deeply at peace, because in this godless world, you'll continue to experience difficulties, but take heart, I've conquered the world. The Amplified Translation takes the original Greek and says it this way, be of good cheer, 
In other words, have a good attitude coming from your heart because you're going to understand some things. Though you live in this world and though it's broken and though there's a mess, be of good cheer. I love the way the Amplified Bible says it because it says, for I have overcome the world on your behalf. I have actually deprived it of its power to harm you. And yet, sometimes it seems like this world harms us, right? Well, working with people, as much as I do, oftentimes people will ask the question, why are, why are things so messed up? Now, let me go backwards for just a second. How many of you know I mentioned the enemy? There is an enemy. His name was Lucifer. He was an archangel. There were three of them. There were Gabriel, Michael, and Lucifer. They each had different responsibilities, Lucifer's responsibility was he was the worship leader in heaven. He directed all of the praise and worship to Jesus. And he became prideful. You can read about it in Isaiah chapter 14 and in Ezekiel, I believe it's 37 and 38. He became prideful, said he would exalt himself above God and God threw him out and he was able to influence a third of the angels that fell with him. So they were, and there's a whole lot of that. We won't go into that part of it, but I do want you to know this. You live in a world where there is an enemy. When God created the earth in Genesis 1, he created it perfect. There was no sin in the earth. Adam and Eve, which God creates all of his creatures with a free will, you get to choose, he creates no robots, does he? You don't have to serve him. He doesn't create any robots. Put Adam and Eve here, and Adam and Eve made some bad choices. Now, the reason I share with you that there is an enemy is because the enemy of your soul lies to you in your life because the battle that you fight in life is not against people, it's not against governments, it's not against politics, it's not against any of those things. The battle that you fight in your life is right up here in your thinking. You win or lose victoriously in your life over the way you think. Yesterday, Joel and I ran to Schnucks. We go into Schnucks, we get our grocery list, that we had been sent to the grocery store with. <laughs> and we're walking out of the grocery store and this guy rides up on his bicycle. Now, this could be any one of us. You've heard the phrase, but for God, there go I. This guy rides up, he's probably close to 60, maybe a little bit over 60 years old. And his appearance was not judging him, but Maybe I'm judging him, but his appearance looked like he probably had lost his driver's license. He's on a, a bicycle. He didn't look like, he looked like he had a very heavy hangover probably. He was not well kept. But I looked past all that and I looked in his face and he looked like he could be a twin to one of my good friends who is a real estate investor who is worth millions and millions and millions of dollars. He's a very close friend of mine. And they look like they could be twin brothers. And I told Joel, I said, Joel, look, the guy on the bike. I said, the amazing thing is if, you, if that guy got a haircut, cleaned himself up, and we put some nice clothes on him, you couldn't outwardly tell the difference between him and the multi, multi-millionaire friend of mine. And Joel goes, Dad, you're right. I said, do you realize that the only difference, because we have a tendency in this world to think what well, somebody succeeds because they're good looking or because they were in the right place at the right time or because of this or that. I said, do you realize that the only difference between him and our friend is the way they think? That's the only difference. Outwardly, they look, this guy could go start thinking like that guy and nobody would think anything different about it. Your thinking, the, what you allow to come in and what you allow to process in your soul is so important. Now, the enemy, the devil, the scripture says he is a liar and has been a liar from the beginning since he was kicked out of heaven. And when he speaks, the scripture says he speaks his native language, which is lies. 
I share that with you to share this. If he is telling you anything, he's lying to you. It's like the old phrase, if his lips are moving, he's lying. He's a liar. And what he does is he tells you and I that we are victims in this world. He tells you, you're unqualified. You've made too many mistakes. You made some bad choices, and now you're paying the consequence for that. God loves you at a distance. He's not really involved. You're not qualified. You're not forgiven. You've messed up too bad. I've been talking about this subject on the midweek services, talking about guilt and shame. Guilt, guilt can be a good thing because you can do something, but the, the, the mere fact that you have guilt about what you did speaks this, that there's a, better, there's a better me on the inside of me, that what I did isn't me. But watch this. Shame is exactly the opposite. When I have shame, I buy into the identity that what I did is who I am. And let me just say this to you. Church, let me help you. What you did is not who you are. I don't ever want you to walk around with shame. If you have guilt, let it be for just a second long enough that you're going this direction and the shame turns you and now you go this direction. You run to God with that. And I bring all of this up because I know what's happening in your heads because it happens in my head too. And that is that the enemy tells you, well, God doesn't care. You've made a mistake. You've made too many mistakes. You're not listening. You're not qualified. You're not worthy. And you can't ever be worthy in and of yourself, but he is worthy. So let's talk about it for a second. Why are bad things happening in this world? And it really is for one reason. I put it in your notes. Rebellion against God broke everything. (laughs) Everything, you'll find out here in just a second, is broken as a result of the rebellion. Romans chapter 5 verse 12 says this. Sin came into the world because of what one man did. Sin came in the world. And because of that sin, death came into the world. Isaiah 53, 6 says, all of us have strayed like sheep and every single one of us have left God's path for our own path in life. So we're all in the same boat there. No one can say Proverbs 20, verse nine. No one can say I'm innocent. I've never done anything wrong. No. You know, there's this phrase that misery loves company. And it is so true, isn't it? That there's something about the enemy that will lie to you and tell you you're the only one going through this. Nobody else has had a wife walk out or a husband walk out or been fired from their job or been you know, alienated like this or betrayed or stabbed in the back like this. But let me tell you the truth. The truth is it's happened to every single one of us in different ways. And the comfort is, Paul said it in the scripture, the good news is this, is that every single one of us are suffering the same thing. Your fellow brothers, they're fighting the same battles that you are. It kind of brings comfort to know that, hey, we're all in this same boat. The enemy's lying to me just like he's lying to you, church. And the good news is we've got one another. We don't have to succumb to the lies of the enemy and live under that type of defeat. But the reason everything is broke is because of the rebellion. Now, there's three types of rebellion. Just to give you a little Bible college education here today, okay? When we use the word sin, but the Bible uses three words for sin. Sin, transgression, and iniquity. What's the difference between sin, transgression, and iniquity? Sin is missing the mark. In other words... You have the potential to do this or be this. God created you with this type of the potential. But sin is because you only see yourself this way and because your thinking is wrong, you never do what your potential is. That's sin. That's an archery term in the Bible. An archery term is you miss the mark. You had this aim, you had this vision, and sin causes you to miss the mark. Now, transgression is a word. That means you break the boundaries of God. God sets up some parameters in life, some boundaries. It said, this will keep you healthy. This will bring you some some problems, some penalties in life. And that's transgression. Now, what we could have done, I thought about just using this. The definition for transgression is teenagers. I just seeing if you're listening. I was one one time, all right? Step out of bounds all the time. The word iniquity, that's the third word the scripture uses, is where because of an anger or an offense or a resentment or a bitterness that that takes place in my heart, 
I retaliate and I have intention to do harm. So I, with intent, harm or do evil. Now, a lot of you guys are football fans. Let me give you the football definition of that. Sin is like the field goal. When you kick the field goal and you miss it, man, I missed that one. The, the next one is transgression. It's like you step out of bounds. You're off sides. Like you, they, before they snap the ball, you step across the line. Oh, man, messed up. Stepped out of bounds with the ball. And then iniquity is where you have intention. That's like a personal foul. That's where like somebody elbowed you or hit you too hard and you retaliate because you're angry and you're mad. Pow. You know what I'm saying? That's what sin is. It's grouped into the, those three categories. And King David talked about it in, in Psalms 32, verse 5. He said, here's the way to handle it. He said, I acknowledge my sin before you, God. I don't cover up my iniquity before you. And I confess my transgressions. And the good news is you have forgiven all of my guilt. So I want to say to you, if you're here today, you're dealing with any kind of guilt or shame. May the good news sets you free from that guilt and that shame that the devil would like to lie to you. Because why I'm so passionate about this is this reason. You can never in your life outperform your self-image. And when I say self-image, I'm talking about the godly image of who you're created to be by God. What I love spending a lot of time on and my prayer for my personal life is someday when I get to heaven, that the Lord gives me two compliments. These are the two that I want. Darren, you got people saved. You cared for the heathens and the lost, and you shared the good news message of hope with them, and the culture and environment of the church that you pastored made it easy for anybody to walk in the door without judgment, without condemnation, and bring them in and let them sit and hear the truth of God's word and eventually say, yes, I want some of that. I want what God has for me. That's my prayer, my number one. The number one thing about Enjoy Church is we love lost people. We are obsessed. We are obsessed with loving on lost people, far away from God people. They don't intimidate us. They don't scare us. We don't judge them. It's, we, didn't, we never have an us and them mentality. They're welcome here with all their heathenistic thoughts and actions. Can I make it any clearer? Number one. Number two is that Darren, the compliment I want to hear someday is, Darren, you helped your congregation that you pastor, you helped them reach a potential that they didn't see even in themselves. So how are you going to see it if you don't see it in yourself? You're going to have to get your identity from God's word. You're going to have to, and, it, and it, it, let me just tell you, it's a lifelong process. It doesn't happen overnight. I am still to this day stretching. I was a shy person in my identity. Therefore, I behaved shy. The very thought of doing what I'm doing right now scared me to death. I remember when God first started dealing with my heart and giving me a picture on the inside of me doing this, it scared me so bad because I could never behave outside of the way I saw myself. And one day, not one day, a process of days but those days began to stretch me on the inside and I began to agree with what he began to speak to me from his word and that agreement caused me to have to walk in faith and sometimes I came against the fear and you guys ought to be thankful you weren't there the first time I preached a sermon <laughs> because my knees were knocking and back in that day we had the old style uh, church we had all the throne chairs remember the big throne chairs in church we had the plants, the big plants on stage, the throne chairs, and we had the big wooden podium. I like all those things, uh, but not that much. <laughs> and someday I ought to bring them all back. You guys will walk in and just be like there. We'll keep them for a week or two, and then we'll put them back. Just to like, what's that? But let me tell you, that first time I was preaching, I loved the fact that we had one of those big old wood podiums. That thing came up to about here on me, and you couldn't see behind it. My knees were knocking, my hands were shaking, and I just ducked down, so all you could see was <laughs> all you could see was my lip quivering. Oh, I'm scared to death. Lord, are you sure you're putting this? And and I began to walk in that, and eventually, eventually, I faced those fears. And let me just tell you, I have no fear about what anybody thinks about me now. 
you know that if you've been around here for any time, I will embarrass myself to preach a sermon to make sure that the truth of God's grace and God's goodness is going out. So I shared with you what caused all this. Let me just run through this list. We're gonna be, okay, we're going to get negative for just a minute so that I can turn it and be positive and leave you with a great message today, okay? So the result of the rebellion is that everything is broken and nothing works perf perfectly. There's six dimensions of life. And if you remember the words of Jesus in John 10, 10, he said, I came that you might have and enjoy life in abundance to the full till it overflows. Well, what is that that he's talking about? Enjoy life. There's six dimensions of life that Christ came for that we have the ability to begin to walk in victory in these areas because of the covenant. When we do communion together, we just did this past midweek. When we share communion together, it's remembering the covenant of what Christ did at the cross. Listen to this. Because of the rebellion, six things were broken. Number one, natural disasters and deformities in the world. Things are broken. Sometimes we feel like, why did this happen? How did the devil do this? Is God mad at me? No, 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 no. We live in a messed up world. Bad things sometimes happen to good people. Romans chapter eight, verse 20 says it this way. Creation was condemned to lose its purpose. Creation is confused, you guys. It's confused. When Adam and Eve rebelled against God, all the glory, remember the scripture says this, for all have sinned and all have fallen short of the glory. What is that glory? We walk around not using the word glory too much, but in the Bible, the word glory means authority. Go back to Genesis, Adam and Eve. God said to them, I give you all authority to rule over the earth, to have dominion, to be fruitful, to multiply, to live life. And what did they do? Because they had a free will. They made a mistake. Probably the same one we would have made too, so don't judge them too quickly. But that's your grandma and grandpa, y'all. And because of the sin that came into the world as a result of Adam and Eve, we needed a second Adam. Paul talks about it in the book of Romans. He gave us a second Adam, a do-over, a mulligan if you're a golfer, a second chance. His name was Jesus. God himself said, I'm gonna go take care of business. Now, here's what's so cool. Study Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. This is like going to Bible college today, isn't it? Study Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And Jesus in those four chapters says this, in those four books says this, I came that you might have life and have it abundantly. I didn't come to condemn the world, but to save the world. And I want to teach you what the kingdom of heaven is like and should be living in your life. So all through those four books, Jesus is always saying, the kingdom of God is like this. The kingdom of God is like that. The kingdom of God is like this. The kingdom of God is like this. And then he said, I give you the keys to the kingdom. I give you all authority from heaven. Pray this way, let it be done on earth as it is in heaven. So part of our mind process is learning how to think like heaven instead of like the earth that we live in circumstantially, all right? So this world is messed up. Second thing is physical decay and death. Next week, you don't wanna miss next week because we are going to teach on death. Now that might sound morbid and it might scare you, but the truth is, is I read recently that the death rate is right about hovering around 100% still. <laughs> Pat Boone sang a, a song that was, how many of you know who Pat Boone is? How many of you don't know who Pat Boone is? Oh my goodness. How many of you old people like me are like going to need to pray for the young people who don't know who Pat Boone. Okay, Pat Boone sang this song, and it was a flop. He never sold one copy of it, but it's a song called Everybody Dies. And he went to a pastor's friend of mine, a church on a Sunday, and sang a special, and the pastor just trusted, this is Pat Boone. I'm sure he'll know what he's doing. He got up and sung a song. 
everybody dies, everybody dies. Young people, old people, fat people, tall people, skinny people, everybody dies. And this morbid feeling came over the whole church. It's Easter Sunday. We're talking about resurrection. <laughs> but, oh, how true his song was. Death is a reality of life. Most of us don't have a proper, healthy, biblical definition of death because we've never died. How many of you are dead? <laughs> no, you haven't experienced it yet, so you don't know what it's like, and it scares us because what death really is is separation. I'm just saying, don't miss next week. You're going to get a whole lot of revelation from next week. And I, I declare over you, you're not going to be scared of death anymore. You won't be scared of it anymore. But... The truth is, as Paul said, our physical bodies are getting older. They are getting weaker. I put a verse in your outline. I'm not going to read it publicly to you because it's so negative. Uh, Solomon, the wisest guy that ever lived, that wrote the book of Proverbs, also wrote the book of Ecclesiastes. I mean, you know, life is like a cycle. Sometimes you're on top, and man, you're living it, and you're grooving it, and you're emotionally you're feeling the joy, and you're feeling good, and you're getting work done. And then other times in life, you've got some issues. Have you guys ever had issues, or is it just me? Sometimes you have issues. And at this point, when Solomon wrote the book of Ecclesiastes, he was on some issues. And I think he needed therapy, medication, drugs. He needed a lot of help because his perspective was messed up. But God allowed that to be put in the Bible for a couple reasons so that you, can, you and I could learn from him the mistakes and how not to think during that time. But he comes along and he says in chapter 12, all the things that are wrong. Man, he was being negative. Your limbs are going to tremble. Your teeth are going to fall out. Your bones are going to rot. You're not going to be able to have a sex drive or nothing. I mean, it's in the Bible. This is the real thing. And you read it later, okay? I don't want you going that negative right now. But so he comes along and says, everything's messed up. And it is messed up in this world. Paul said in... 1 Corinthians 15, 22, everybody dies because we're all related to Adam. And, and he talks a lot about that. But let me hit number three. We have emotional distress because of the rebellion in the world and everything being broke. I said the up and the down. The results are sometimes we're disappointed. Sometimes we don't get what we're hoping for, we're wishing for. We would love that this happen. Now, sometimes I've discovered that's an answered prayer to me. How many of you know that guy you wanted to date in high school and God didn't let you date him? 30 years later, you're going, oh, yeah. <laughs> the thing about life is life can be emotionally distressed and disappointing, right? And, you know, it's kind of like this. I see this being a pastor and, and having performed a lot of weddings through the years. A lot of single people, it's funny, they think that the hole in their heart and the happiness will come once I finally find a spouse. They think once I finally get married, my life will be complete. Are there any married people in the room? Can I get a witness up in this house that not one of you would testify that's the truth, right? Not one. Because although marriage can be fulfilling, the mere fact that you have two people, different people, come together under one roof, come together one in the spirit, sparks fire. Our first five, Pastor Laura and I, our first five years of marriage was like 4th of July. <laughs> we loved each other. Some of it, some of the fireworks was passion and love, and some of it was, you are not changing me, girl. I am not going to change for you. I'll change I'll let God change me, but quit trying to change me and me for her too, right? Today, we learn, we're, we're learning how to walk victoriously in that. Let me just, the reason I'm bringing that up is we put our hope oftentimes in the wrong things. We think a lot of single people are going, if I could just get married, my life would be complete and I'd be happy. And then you get married and it's not. And there's a whole bunch of married people that are romancing the idea of what it would be like to be single. Oh my goodness, to be free again. They're romancing my time, my, uh, my energy, 
my life. Let me just say, if you look for life fulfillment in anything other than God, you'll always fall short in the fulfillment of your life. And so the fourth thing that's broken is relations, relationship, which I just mentioned, the distance and the discord. We, people are people. And people will be, be, be people wherever you go. People are people at Starbucks. People are people at Shop and Save at Schnooks. People are people at church. People are people, and people will disappoint people. And hurting people hurt people. And in life, we have husbands and wives that hurt each other. We have children that hurt parents, parents that hurt children. We have coworkers that hurt one another. Let me just say to you, it would be great if we all get along, but it's not a reality. Everything is broken. I told you I was going to go negative for just a second, but I'm going to get somewhere in just a second, and you're going to love it. The fifth one is financial and vocational difficulties. Economics are up, and they're down, and they're up, and they're down, and the economy is doing great, and then it's not doing good, and it's the same way in our lives. Our personal economy, sometimes we're on top of it. Other times we have stress and finances. Our businesses can be good or bad. Our jobs can be good or bad at different times. The world can be broken. And the sixth one is spiritual discontentment. This is the biggest one and the most important one to address. If you get this one right, you'll begin to make adjustments in the other five. Watch this one. There is a hole on the inside of us because you were designed by God, you were created by God to have a fellowship, a relationship, and a communication with God and to be a friend of God, not to just know about him. God literally wants to be involved in your everyday life, in your marriage, in your vocation, in your finances, in your business, in your emotional well-being. And this process that I've been teaching you over these last few midweek sessions and over this series is we are changing the way we see ourselves in Christ because the scripture says, in Christ you can do all all things, where when I thought my limit was that, he stretched my vision. Now I've got this gap from my behavior to the way he sees me as, and now I have to walk by faith. And as I do, I find out I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And that, is, that ceiling is always going up, and it is in your life too. You win or lose the battle right up here in the mind of how you think. And when you feed on God's word like we're doing today, faith comes by Romans chapter 10, verse 17. Faith comes by hearing the word. And if you read the full chapter, hearing the word preached, not just reading it. That, that brings some revelation. But hearing explanation is like the lights coming on in a room and you've dropped something in the darkness and all of a sudden the lights come on and now you find it. And not only do you find it, you find a whole bunch of other stuff in the room that you didn't know was there. That's the way it is with God in a relationship with God. So you're gonna love this. You are gonna love this. So what's the solution to living in this broken world? Well, we know now that Jesus came to fix what was broken. And that's why he came teaching the covenant and teaching the kingdom. The very first thing that you have to do is accept what he did for you. You have to receive the free gift of salvation. Well, I know about God. Yes, that's where it starts is knowing, but then you have to receive. Ephesians 2.8 says this, it's God's grace that saved you through faith. It's not a result of your own effort, but it's a gift from God that no one can boast about it. Number two, follow his light. Listen to this verse, John 8. These are the words of Jesus. I am the light of the world, and if you follow me, you won't stumble through the darkness because you'll have the light that leads you to life. That almost sounds new agey. I'm enlightened. But let me just share with you what that means. You're enlightened. <laughs> what happens is this. When you accept Christ, now you have relationship with him, his Holy Spirit comes to live in you, literally in you. And when you hear the word, the understanding, the revelation of that word comes, and he's talking about spiritual things. Now the light illuminates 
so you can live the life, the relationships, the job, the way you do life, all the things that pertain to life, your joy, your emotions, your pleasure at work, the freedom to be free from the addictions that held us captive and the crazy depression and the thought life. As you follow the light, he gives you the life. That's why he said, I came that you might have life and have it abundantly and enjoy it. So the lights are coming on, all right? I've been pretty peaceful up until this time, but the first service got the full... (laughs) I've been trying to hold it back. Number three, this is why we do what we do here, is so that you can learn who he made you to be. How many of you know he's the creator, he's the designer? Who am I to tell the designer how something should be? The designer who created it and made it should tell me how it works and why he created it the way that he created it. And the problem in our lives, so many of us, is that he created us with so much more potential than we're currently living because we see it according to the environment that we grew up in, the lies that the enemy has told us, the limitations that he's placed on us. The enemy will set you up for years to hold you back. And I'm so overwhelmed and I'm really humbled that I would be in a position to be the preacher that gets to be a part of the process of your faith walk. That to watch, I've watched many of you do this. I've literally watched the lights come on in your spirit and you realize who you are in Christ. And I've watched you. I've watched who you've become. I've watched Adam and Christine, they're back in town with us. I've watched them from the first time they started coming to enjoy church. And I've watched them just grow so, so much spiritually. And, and, and be blessed the way that they are today, walking in that life. I've watched many of you, I could start going through and saying that about so many of you. But John 1 says this, as many as received and welcomed him, he gave them the authority, the authority, there it is, the glory, the authority, and the privilege to become the children of God. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 17 says, the person who is united, that's what we do every time we do communion, you unite with him, becomes one with him in spirit. I was an electrician, and the word, some of you will know this, the word for a complete circuit is unity. There's unity in that circuit. That means that there's a complete circuit. It means unified. It means that it's one. When you look at a person, we are the body of Christ, right? Right? But the scripture says he is the head. Now, how many of you know no healthy person has their head on one side of the room and their body on the other side of the room? We call those dead people. Are, we, are you with me? When Christ is in us and we walk in that unity of his fellowship and his spirit by hearing the word, letting our mind be renewed by the word, we're in unity. We're one. The head is Christ. We're the body. Now, watch this scripture. 1 John chapter 3. How many of you, like me, have a big imagination? I got this huge imagination. I can imagine all kinds of crazy stuff that I'd be too embarrassed to share with you. I mean, it's fun, but I'll I'll share a little bit with you right here on this verse. It says in verse 2, Beloved, we are here and now God's children. Yet it's not been disclosed or made clear what we shall be hereafter, But we know that when he comes and he is manifested, we will be as God's children, resemble and be like him, for we shall see him just as he really is. Now think about this. Here in this broken world, with a side of my flesh that's still sinful and still messed up, I still have to battle the whole issue of thinking right and obeying him. We live in a broken world where there's earthquakes, hurricanes, physical disasters, emotional distresses, death, decay, rottenness. We've got an enemy. We've got all of these bad things around us. And yet, when you receive Christ, he calls you a child of his. You're created in his image. And until we can begin to see the image, the picture of who we are, now that we are born again, we behave 
under control of the authority of the broken world. But when you realize who you're a child of God, he's given you the keys to the kingdom, the authority of the kingdom. And it is really weird when you first start doing it. When I first started preaching, it was weird. When I first started walking in obedience to the revelation and the knowledge of who I was, it was weird. It stretched me but just keep doing it. It's called the walk of faith. Just keep doing it. Just keep doing it. And eventually it becomes normal to you to walk in. Now, here's my imagination. Here in this life, you're called the children of God. It's not yet been made clear what you'll be after this life. So let's use our imagination. We know this universe has, Hubble telescope has discovered over 400 billion universes. Who knows? Maybe Taylor, maybe you're going to get to be over the fourth galaxy and you get to be the ruler of the fourth galaxy. Wouldn't that be cool? I'm just using my imagination. It may not be like that at all. I'm, this is not in the Bible, but this is in the Bible. <laughs> I better tell you that. I remember I was in that service and pastor said, you get to rule the galaxy. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying I've got this huge imagination. I don't know what that looks like, but I do know it is in the scripture that says, here you're God's child. And once this is all over, it's not even been made clear what's gonna happen after this. I don't know what that looks like, but I challenge you to use your imagination. And the last verse, Romans chapter nine, verse 30 says, we have attained salvation. Now that word salvation in the Greek is the word sozo. It's like a circle. It's an all-inclusive. This salvation, God did not just save you from hell or from sin. He saved you from guilt, shame, sin, hell, but he also saved you from the disasters that are associated with that group. The Bible calls it covenant, and we'll spend some time talking about it. He says here, you didn't attain salvation. You attained salvation by faith because God His righteousness was imputed to you. The word impute means that he literally made you to be his righteousness. The word righteous means you're right with God. Another way of saying it in the Greek is you are worthy. I don't feel worthy. He has made you worthy, not because you've been good, but because of the work that he did on the cross. And if you really wanna take this to the next level, start thanking him. Recognize everything good in your life. If anything good happens to you, go ahead and give God credit for it. Scripture says that all good things come from him. Go ahead and give him credit. Go ahead and thank him. In fact, you could start it right now, right here in this service. Just start saying, thank you, Jesus. Thank you for that. Thank you for that. You know, and let me just share a principle. This principle of when you mix gratitude and thanks with emotion, Boom, power is delivered in your life. Think about your your own relationships when somebody comes to you and says, thank you. The eye blank, thank you. Well, don't you feel like happy about it? Yes. How many of you know when somebody comes to you and they've got emotion and there's tears in their eyes, you don't know what you did when you did that. Thank you so much. That changed my life. How many of you know? Oh, you want to give him more. (laughs) Oh, I want to do more for you. Are you with me? So why don't we just really, we could start it right now. We could start it right now. We could start with a song that declares our thanks to Jesus. So church, we prayed. We've opened our hearts. We've received the word. What if just for a few minutes, you let down your cares and worries about who's at church or who might see you. And over these next couple of seconds together, let's just thank him for what he's done for us. Band, will you lead us in a song?